there's this piece around the changing culture with regards to the setting of the rocks, the expectation. Moving from culturally for a lot of people, what was different before, the finger pointing, the blame game is to where and what is it that we need to do to set ourselves up for kind of, of success. success absolutely love about EOS is that when you get to the stage of changing an organization. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. A little while ago, I got my colleague and fellow EOS implementer, Adam Harris, onto the show, and we had such a great time talking about EOS and tools and, and, and case studies and examples of our own clients, we decided we should make it a regular occurrence. So welcome to another episode of Deborah and Adam Talk EOS. Welcome to the show, Adam. Great to see you. Great to be here. That's amazing. I'm looking forward to talking about all things EOS with you. So it's been a while since we've had you on the show. Yeah. I think you were last on the show back in, it might have even been 18 months ago, possibly. Yeah, it feels, I, I'd either was thinking about becoming an EOS implementer or just become yep. a full-time EOS implementer. So yeah. yeah, it's been a while. Been a while. So it's good to have you back on. So now obviously you and I are working really closely together, doing a yep. lot of work around EOS. And so the purpose of the podcast this time around is to actually share some of our experiences working with clients and what's going on there. Yep. So like, why don't we start with your story? So why did you become an EOS implementer? Long story short. So I used to be a chair for an organization called Vistage. So, Which is also tech, right? Vistage yeah, and tech are the same thing. Yep. yep. Although Tech actually in, in Australia and New Zealand is literally just going through a rebrand at the moment. So they're oh. actually becoming. Oh, good. Okay. Cool, uh, cool. So I was running a mastermind group for 16 chief executives. And one of my members said, oh, I've just read this book called Traction. So this is going back about eight years ago. I need somebody. And EOS at that point wasn't even, you know, anywhere really outside uh, other than the US. So he said, look, I need somebody to help implement it. I'm like, okay, cool. And I kind of just, as I kind of started reading Traction and I started supporting this company through it, I kind of fell in love. And there was two things for me. One was the simplicity of it. And then the second thing for me was about the ability to cascade it through the through an organization. I've seen a lot of tools and processes that can be used. In fact, I wrote a book called The Check-In Strategy Journal. But this, the way that it was kind of all put together just kind of made sense. So I kind of worked in the UK probably for about four or five years supporting companies doing EOS, not as a kind of a, a full-time EOS implementer. And then when we moved to New Zealand and we moved to New Zealand, partly because of EOS, uh, we set our 10 year target. Our 10 year target was to live nomadically and New Zealand is the first step on, on that journey. And about three years ago, read EOS life, probably not long after you popped in to see us down in New Plymouth. And it was like, actually, you know, listening to EOS live. Do what you love with people that you love, being compensated accordingly, with time for other pursuits making a huge difference. I was like, did you know what? The best work I was doing when I was in uh, a session doing EOS, and it's like, actually, you know what? Now's the time. So got involved, and that was about, about 18 months ago. Wow. Well, there yeah. you go. And now here we are. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, you still keep your hand in terms of running other businesses, though, don't you? Yes. So I'm also managing director of an IT company. We've got our own data center down in uh, New Plymouth, and mm -hmm. we've just expanded out into uh, Hamilton. And we're also looking at extending into Australia as well. So uh, implementing EOS in, down there, and we're starting now to get the growth that we've we've been looking for. Yeah. So. And lots of other different things. I'm, I'm a typical visionary entrepreneur. Yep. <laughs> uh, I can't, I, you know, I, I, I kind of, and I was, I was reflecting on this the other day. I need to be involved with things that excite me mm -hmm. and to be challenged. If I'm standing still, I'm kind of going backwards very, very quickly. So I, I you know, I, I, I have always suffered from golden penny syndrome. Yep. I have to be really careful and mindful, but yeah, I, I've got, to, my mind has got to be challenged. Otherwise I start going stale. Yeah, no, I think we're off the same ilk. I mean, certainly I've got, so I'm involved in AI kind of 
security retail business, yes. which is a very, very small shareholding, but involved in that business. Plus, of course, we've got the EOS stuff and now we're doing, looking at doing the retreat down in the Hawke's Bay and, and the same sort of thing. It's like, I'm, I love EOS and when I'm in the session, I'm at my happiest place. But at the same time, I think keeping your hand in with other things makes you a better EOS implementer. Oh. Because it's not like you've given up work, gone off and done EOS, and some, some EOS implementers potentially that's all they're doing for mm -hmm. a, a long, long time. Whereas we've got the the benefit and the beauty of being involved in running a business at the same time as you know teaching yeah, other I, people. I feel the variety. I love going into having conversations with people, mm -hmm. and whether that be with EOS or with anything else. And what I what I find is is the the variables and the differences are actually where the, those little nuggets are yep. like so I'll, I'll give you a, an example of it nando's not massively popular here in kind of new zealand but it was really really big in uh, in the uk oh. and what you used to do is you used to go up to the till you ordered your food they gave you a cockerel with a number on yeah. you put it in the middle uh, where the not in the pot where the knives and forks were and then they deliver your food and after five minutes they come in and say hey just want to check that everything's all right with your food and then they take the cock crawl away and i was like i just observed this like two or three times it's like actually that checkpoint in with the customer to mm. just ensure that everything's all right and i took that and implemented it within the it business that i had at the time and just that that check-in 24 to 36 hours after doing a server and a big you know big server install to just go hey deborah just want to check everything's all right Actually, do you know what? We've still got a few niggles and bits and pieces. Is that kind of forearmed was forewarned. So we, that proactiveness like came from just sitting in Nando's and just kind of going from there. And I love those things on a daily basis of just picking up and learning. Have, have you got any examples of, of that sort of thing? Well, I'm thinking more that I've now, because I've been doing the fractional integrator role in the AI business. And so it's actually given me a huge insight into what my integrators must go through in the business. Working with, you know, dodgy visionaries like myself, it's yep. sort of, it, it is really interesting to sort of be involved in different roles and just take different things from it. So I've realized that sometimes when I'm taking, I'm talking to people about what they could be doing, I'm actually drawing on the experiences that I'm, you know, um, learning in my own business by taking on a different role. Has that meant that you're a little bit more forgiving in the session room? Yeah, a little bit. Not much, not much. <laughs> and of course, I don't ever tell people what to do, but I can share some experiences with them and say, hey, this is in my experience. I mean, yep. like I had a classic example. It's like, I'm going to be really vulnerable here. Our business is running on EOS, right? There's, like, we've got about, I think, so about 14 staff now. It's growing reasonably rapidly. And, you know, when we did our first planning session and we were, we'd done our focus day, learned the tools, come into vision building, the team set wanted to set 11 rocks. Well, actually, they wanted to set 22 rocks. And I went, there's no way in the world we're doing 22 rocks. We're going to do 11. And I was like, no, 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 we're, we're super smart. We can, we can definitely do 11. I was like, you can't do 11 rocks in my entire history of running EOS with other businesses. Nobody has ever achieved anything close to that. And less is more if everything's important, nothing is important. But they absolutely insisted. And so it's like, okay, um, you know, you can lead a horse to water. It's not my role to tell them what to do. So I allowed them to do it. And, you know, at the end of the quarter, they came back and they went, we've done really well. We've done four out of five rocks. And I went, we didn't have five rocks. We had 11 rocks. Um, and it's sort of like, no, 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 we, we, we narrowed it down to five. We decided 11 was too much. So I suppose, what am I, where am I getting to? In our own business, we, uh, I've had to really instill that whole thing of actually you, you need to do less is more and you need to be really honest with yourself. So you can't say you're doing 11 and then remove six because it felt a bit easier, then come back and say you've achieved four out of five. And so I suppose it's, it's been interesting. I've been implementing with companies now for about four and a half years. We've been using EOS in our small team, but we've been really, really good at it. Once you get a slightly bigger team, mm -hmm. there's definitely different elements that come into it. And yeah. so, you know, I've learned that actually even my own team who are EOS advocates don't always follow the process. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, like, I often find that there's this, there's this, this transition piece of, you know, you kind of do focus day, vision building day one and two, and the energy is really, really high. And it kind of, for me, often feels that there's a dip kind of going, you know, coming in around Q1, Q2, possibly Q3. I think it depends on the, on the, the organization where kind of shit's now getting real and we're, we're starting to follow the process. And I think that that's the time I think for some companies when they're probably at the most vulnerable, cause it's, it's really now beginning to kind of get hard. And there's this, there's this piece around the changing culture with regards to the setting of the rocks, the expectation. And moving from, you know, culturally, probably for a lot of people, what was different before, kind of the finger pointing, the blame game is to 
where and what is it that we need to do to set ourselves up for kind of, of kind of success? success? Something just came through to me while you were talking. What's the difference then? Because you, you mentioned about like, you know, 22 rocked, which yep. is kind of, you know, not lunacy. <laughs> What's the difference then between a rock and a to-do? So a rock, the way I always kind of describe it is it is a distinct piece of work that's going to move the needle on the business. It's the stuff that makes a business go better, be more efficient, whatever it might be. And it is a distinct piece of work that cannot be done in a short time. So to do is an action point in seven days. It's a very, very small bite-sized piece of work, often comes from solving issues in a weekly meeting that is about your business as usual and you and a to-do comes out of solving that issue. Whereas a rock is a, a distinct piece of work over 90 days where we go, this piece of work can be done within 90 days and will really improve the way the business is run. It will move the needle. Cool. And you can't, you know, if you think about it, the way I always say, so a 90 day rock, you kind of go, we've got 90 days to do it. Well, you don't really, because if you use the Pareto principle, 80, 20, 80% yep. of your time is spent on business as usual, which is monitored by your scorecard. That's the stuff that keeps the doors open, keeps the money coming in, keeps everybody paid. 20% yep. is the rocks, which is the important stuff that actually moves the needle, which means you've only actually got one day out of five in total to spend on that important stuff that moves the needle. Mm -hmm. Of that, you've got meetings. So you've probably got three hours of your level 10 meetings out of that. So that leaves you five hours a week. So that's really only one hour a day that you've got to work on rocks. So when you start to think about a rock, it shouldn't be a boulder that is a, we're going to install a new CRM system. Yep. Not, you know, you're not going to do that in 90 days. What is the rock? What is a distinct piece of work that I can do in about five hours a week over 13 weeks to actually you know, move that needle. So with the CRM system example, it might be in the next 90 days, all that we really want to do is look at what we currently have, where the gaps are, come up with a functional requirements, yeah. look at a few options, and that's kind of it. So that would be the first phase. And I, I think it's often also important to, you know, and depending on, on what's going on in the session, but definitely within 48 hours, is to take those rocks and actually kind of sit down and go, right, okay, if I was going to do a to-do list for the next 12 weeks, what's what's those milestones that i need to be hitting so you're almost kind of creating the roadmap yeah and you know you know that saying kind of you know we we say it often within eos you know how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time i i really think that it, it, there's a mindset shift that people need to go through is to get into the stage in the habit of kind of breaking things down you know the stuff that's right in front of it's really really easy the stuff in the you know out in the future is kind of blurry it's 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 that kind of 90 mile uh no, 90 day march and when you can get that consistency going individually and as a collective team you're like you know we've both seen some phenomenal results in how things happen with uh, with companies mm -hmm. and these days i actually with most of my teams i will get them to at least highlight four or five main milestones in the session so then i say and then now in your next meeting within the next 48 hours you're going to get really granular around that and be really certain of what's going to be done and put the dates on it because we don't put dates on that we just go these are the five key things what does success look like so we've got the end goal, which is the number five milestone. That's complete success. The rock is completed. The other four are like, what are the bits in between we're going to get around to doing? And then they have to go away and think very carefully, are they, those the main things? What are the time frames that they should be put on those? Because that gives them a chance to kind of check in every week and go, are we actually really on track or are we kidding ourselves? So let's talk about this aspect then. You know, we're, we're you know, coming to a meeting, the level 10 meeting, and we're mm -hmm. checking in on the scorecard and the rock. What's the role of the integrator uh, outside of the level 10 meeting? In terms of the well, in, 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 in terms, terms of the whole business or in terms of the rocks? What are you asking? Uh, well, let's go with rocks first. And then, yep. Because I think, you know, a lot of the times, you know, a, a lot of people read traction or get a grip or yep. rocket fuel. And I, I, I often find that entrepreneurs are really too easy to understand the visionary role. They're kind of like, oh my God, you got me down to a T. Yeah. And then often people, you know, seeing they... They go, I can see and understand and get the role of the integrator, but I'm not really sure how, where, and what is it different to kind of somebody that's just in, in kind of operations. So, you know, first and foremost, let's go for an overview perspective first. What do you believe is the role of the integrator within a, within a business? So the role of the integrator in my mind is I, I describe them as a conductor. So I'm a musician. My husband's a musician. We like the whole music analogy. Yep. And so if you think about it, the visionary is actually the composer. They're the person who comes up with the music and decides what wants to go on. And they're very good at being very creative around that. The conductor's role is to make sure that all of the instruments in the orchestra are executing on what the composer has put together in a way that actually works because sometimes composers don't always get it right either. So the integrator is like that, that conductor who is there to kind of go, okay, I've got the plan. 
I have to take complete ownership of that plan and enable the team to actually execute on that plan. So I have to lead them to where we're going, manage them, hold them accountable to actually actually executing on that, that plan, which of course we call the Vision Traction Organizer or VTO. And then they're there to help people. So removing obstacles and barriers. So when we have the level 10 meeting, we're looking at the rocks. Let's just say we had a rock and it was, I don't know, what the rock is a certain thing we had to get done this 90 days. And we've got our four or five milestones. We're into kind of week five and all the way through the person who owned that rock's going, yes, I'm on track. Yes, I'm on track. The integrator should be looking at going, okay, so these are the things that we agreed with the milestones that had to happen. We always trust our people to do what they, they, they're held accountable for. But our role is to actually question it and kind of go, okay, as an integrator, we, you say you're on track, but we're supposed to have done some of these kind of key milestones. Can we drop that to the issues list and just get an update and make sure that we are on track and then be there to remove any obstacles and barriers that are stopping us from getting there? So it could be that, you know, we drop it down to the issues list. It ends up being one of the issues we discuss. They find there's an issue that's stopping them from actually moving forward. It could be a budgetary constraint. It could be the visionary sticking their fingers into the pie. It could mm. be a you know, a capacity issue at the moment. And then the integrate as well as to work with that team to, to, to remove those obstacles and barriers and get them back on track again. Yeah. That's the way I see it. So really, really, really similar. I suppose the, the phrase that I often use is kind of a mother hen. Oh uh, yeah. So somebody that's, you know, I, I think it's really important to, you know, and it, it takes some time to change the culture in, you know, asking the right questions, mm -hmm. you know, moving to, you know, the, a circle of trust. And then, you know, there's a number of things, especially that we do kind of at, at annual, but uh, for me, I think often it's that mother hen who knows that at the right point, they've got, they've got full visibility of what's going on, but actually what's not going on. Yep. And, you know, uh, and I, I do think that it needs to often, you know, uh, there can be a bit of kid touch, which means that they've kind of got to, they know when to prod, Yep. but they then know also know when to kind of put the arm around and, you know, and, and, and do, and do that. So highly often kind of, you know on the you know on the eq scale yeah. and they're they're just they're just sensing the flow of the energy as to what's working and what what's not working so when we then think about the the aspects of then of the rocks yep should they be asking the questions in in the one-on-ones or should that you know or should it be in the level 10 what's your thoughts on where is the right place and time to be having the pot, the prod or the poke or the, uh, you know, the, the, the arm round. So I always sort of say, if you're running EOS purely, you don't need to have one-on-ones all the time with people. You're having a quarterly conversation about how things are going, what's going on. You actually should be dealing with the issues that are around the rocks in that level 10 meeting. But obviously, if you see that it is a personal kind of issue, you want to, might want to take that offline and have a conversation with that person. But the, the whole point of EOS is that the whole team is there for the greater good. So just because I have ultimate accountability for a rock does not mean I actually have to do it. I have to engage with the team and get their help to do it as well. So I think that the integrator needs to make sure that if, the, if there's a feeling that the rock isn't on track, it is raised as an issue. The discussion around how we can resolve that issue is done with the whole team because sometimes the ideas come from the most bizarre places. Like I've sat in sessions where it has been a financial issue and yet the person who comes up with the, the, the solve, if you like, for the, 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 the solve for that issue is not in the finance department. It's somebody who's in operations. Somebody's actually on the shop floor who's kind of gone, well, what about if we did this? So I think that the, the great thing about EOS is, yes, you have ultimate accountability, but we've got this massive brains trust in the leadership team that we can actually take uh, issues to if we aren't able to solve them and they can actually help resolve them. And then the integrator is about making sure everybody is having a fair say in that. They're not there to provide the answers. They're not there to tell people what to do. They're there to facilitate that discussion to get to the, the, the right answer. And, and that's one of the things that I absolutely love about EOS is that when you get to the chain, the stage of changing an organization from moving from kind of silo departmental to kind of that full understanding and visibility. And, and part of that is around kind of workload and rocked and, you know, and all aspects like that, but actually beginning to understand that just because I'm not in your vertical space mm -hmm. doesn't mean that I can't ask some amazingly great questions that's going to prod and poke you or that, you know, Dave over here is going to kind of go, well, have you thought about doing this? Like that, that, that kind of shift, you know, really, um, really starts changing the mindset of first and foremost, the leadership team, yeah. but then into the rest of the, of the culture of the organization, because people then really begin to understand going, oh, you know, and that's even before we start talking about, you know, process, I begin to understand a little bit more about what goes on in your world 
because we're all rowing in now rowing in the same direction, heading for, you know, heading for the destination. Yeah. And if you think about it in those level 10 leadership team meetings, you know, they, there's a representative from each major function of the business, which means you've actually got diversity of thought. So when you're actually trying to solve a problem, it's not all the accountants sitting around trying to come up with the accounting answer or all the operations people trying to come up with or sales and marketing people come up with sales and marketing answers. And those rocks, are, like I said at the beginning, are the things that actually move the needle and move the business forward towards that long-term vision. Mm -hmm. So actually having everybody involved in those discussions as and when needed, like I said, full accountability to get on with it and do it if you can. But if you've got an issue, bring it up and then use all of us who will give you that perspective from a, an entire leadership team level. I think it's brilliant. Where should we go next? <laughs> so I, I think the level 10 meeting is a really interesting one because I have lots of teams who sort of say, okay, so we're running our level 10 meeting. It's always a game changer. No matter what team I work with, mm. when we come back to our first vision building or second vision building, I go, what's working, what's not working? Level 10 meetings, without a doubt, are one of the top things of what's working for them. So that changes their entire um, organization and the way that they work. But what people struggle with is how do we take those down to a next level or an even lower level, like a couple of levels down? Yep. And do I still need to have daily stand-ups, you know, regular weekly meetings with my team members, et cetera, et cetera? I'd love to hear your view on that. <laughs> yeah. So I think the first thing is, is that you either, it's a difficult one because, mm -hmm. you know, when's the right time to do it? I like to, I, I like to get teams to the to the stage where they're doing as much of it, even in, in, in quarterlies, it's like, I like them to be, be doing the work. So if we're, you know, up on the board and stuff like that, I'm, yeah. I'm looking to empower them as, as quickly as possible. I think it's, for me, it's important to get that, that they really know and understand how it's working and not working. And then there really kind of needs to be a conversation to kind of go, are we all on board? You know, are we, are we absolutely committed that this is what we're going to do? Because you know, it, it's all well and good. And I've seen this happen so many times before in organizations where they pick an operating system or they pick a process or something, they do it for a period of time, it gets a little bit difficult and then, and then it drops away. Yeah. So I think for me, there's a real important piece is, are you absolutely committed that EOS is going to run this business moving forward? Mm -hmm. If you are, we need to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Yep. Once everybody's then on the same page, you're going, yep, yeah, we're fully committed going, right. Okay. How, how will we know that this is going to be going to be working and i think you know what i've seen work really well is it actually becomes a rock for the quarter is you know roll out a level 10 meetings next level down or the level down mm -hmm. so that you know sitting there in you know in the leadership level 10 is like are we on track or off track oh we're off track why are we off track you know because this is happening well this isn't happening the, the dialogue and the conversation around that i feel it really really needs to be needs to be had and then it's kind of a case of going right okay do you as a leadership team know and understand fully? I almost kind of, you know, flip it over to them and go, right, you're going to have to teach me, yep. you know, help me, help teach me what is, because you're going to be doing this with your teams. So you've now, you've got to show and prove to me, but rest of the leadership team that you're in the place that you, that you can do it. And then I think once they've done then done that, it's then right. Okay. Let's go into, let's do that, drop it down into the departmentals. But if it's then becoming a rock and all of them are doing it, then they're kind of coming back and going, right, okay, so the integrator may well own the rock. Are we on track or off track? What's the issues that are coming up so we can be discussing them to go, oh, I had this situation. Yeah. How do we how do we deal with it? So that checking point, I think, is really, really important. Otherwise, you get to the point of kind of three months down the line and it's like, well, yeah, my team's not taken to it. Oh, you know, and yeah. it, 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 and you could there's a real danger of causing a lot of pain and a lot of problem. So those checking points are really, really key. Yeah. And I think you're right. You've got to be ready to do it. And I also say to a lot of my um, companies as well, it's like, if you're not ready to let go of certain meetings, because so, everybody wants to, I don't want to let go of our daily standards. I don't want to let go of this. It's like, okay, fine. Then go ahead and do both for a while. And let's just see how it kind of works out for you. And what I found is over time, once they get the level 10 meetings really working throughout the leadership team, the management, the next level down, the other meetings just tend to slip away because I don't need them anymore. But it's hard because, you know, if you've been doing daily stand-ups and you think it's really important, then I always say maybe, maybe they do need to stay. I mean, there's no, I think the thing about EOS, it's a framework. There's no absolutes. It gives you the tools to run the business more effectively, more efficiently, have a lot more fun with it. But at the end of the day, if a daily stand-up is also a really adding value to the business, it can be done with a weekly level 10 meeting. There's no issue with that. Yeah. So there's a couple of other things I'd add. I think the first thing is, is that remember this ad adage, you know, 
in order to hear something for the first time, you need to hear it seven times. Well, so that's 32 times now. Oh, is it 32? To, current research says that with all the technology we've got going on, it's now 32 times. How many times? 32. Did you get that? It's 32 <laughs> times. So look, there's, I think there's a real key thing as to how embedded EOS is into the wider business. So, mm -hmm. you know, have the, you know, coming out of the quarter as the town hall meeting has been happening where the visionary has been sharing. So the, the commonality of the language is clear. Coming out of the leadership level tens, has there been conversations with the teams around? So if, if you're, if you're in, introducing it straight from a standing start, it's like, you know, people are going to go, what's this all about? Whereas if the terminology and the language around level 10 meetings is already there, yeah. I, I feel that that helps. And then obviously the other thing is, is that there's so much resource that is, is available um, to ensure, you know, um, I think formally, but also informally is really, really key. So what, from a rollout perspective, are we going to make everybody read what the heck is EOS? Is there a certain amount of videos, you know, both you and I have got videos, podcasts, et cetera. What is it that we're formally going to give every member of the team within, you know, that has got to listen or watch? Yeah. And then where are we going to actually signpost them to, to go, look, you know, if you, you know, if you're high on fact finding and you want to load, you want to know a load of more information, here's a, here's some resources going, you know, go to, here's the internal library of all the kind of EOS books, et cetera, mm -hmm. to make it really, really easy for people to, to understand both on the formal and on the informal. Yeah. And I think that's absolutely true. I was just thinking it's sort of, it can be especially with entrepreneurs, you know, we, we want to move really fast. And so, you know, we come out of our vision building days. We're like, oh, we should start putting this the whole organization. And it's like, actually, you need to, as you said, be committed, first of all. But secondly, you need to have really mastered those tools. Because it's like if I, if I drive a car in a certain way, and maybe it's not the absolute correct way, and I then start to teach you how to drive that car, you're going to pick up on all the bad habits that I've already got in terms of driving the car. And you're going to then drive a car that's not quite the right way. Well, so, you've, uh, so my daughter's about to start learning to drive. Oh, is she? I hope you're not uh, teaching her. <laughs> <laughs> I have consciously made the decision that I am definitely not going to teach her because yeah. exactly like that, yeah. you know, we've all got bad habits. Yeah. And I think this is actually where the relationship with an implementer then actually becomes really key is like, like leaning on them. What's the, what's the resources, yep. you know, EOS themselves, uh, have got so much resources oh. that, you know, that they give away, give away freely. So it's just signposting and the, when the implementer knows and understands the business and, and the culture and the, the level of knowledge. So, you know, you know, I said it right at the start, one of the reasons why I love EOS is the ability to be able to cascade through an organization. Mm -hmm. But even with that, within that, it's about understanding the pitch and the level of where somebody needs to go. So somebody reading what the heck is EOS like that. Anybody can read that. It's a nice, right. Book. Yeah. Um, get a grip. I wouldn't be recommending that everybody should read it because it's really kind of from, you know, from a higher level perspective. Mm -hmm. So work with your implementer. Either reach out to you know either either of us, or actually just do your own research and work out. Okay, and this is why I think it's important to have a rock because one of the steps, you know, one of the to dos during the twelve weeks should be what's our plan? Mm -hmm. How are we going to you know make the resources and the training available to give these people what they need? Just turn around and going, oh, we're now going to do level ten meeting. Yeah, and people go, what's a level ten meeting? They need to understand a little bit of context that will then allow it to kind of cement moving moving forward. And I think you're making a really good point there. The common language thing is something that's really important. It's like I always say to clients, I don't care what you call these things. I prefer you use the EOS terms, but I don't really care what you call them as long as you all call them the same thing. So we're not calling them KPIs, or if we are, we're all calling them KPIs. We're calling them measurables. We're all calling them measurables. If we talk about level 10 meetings, they're level 10 meetings. They're not yep. um, level 10 meetings at one level, and then they're a team meeting at another level. We've got to make sure we have that consistency. Because people need to hear it over and over again. and just 32 know, times. 32 times. <laughs> One of the tools I've been using quite a bit with my clients just recently is the mid-manager meeting. And yep. that is a, bit, a really, really good tool. So just when you feel what it is. Okay, so the mid-manager meeting is about really teaching those five foundational tools to the, the mid-managers that they've got. So the five foundational tools are our VTO, which is our vision traction organizer, our two-page strategic plan. We've got the the scorecard, which is the things we're measuring, the business as usual, that 80% of the work we do. You've got the rocks at the stuff that's really important that moves the stuff forward. You've got the accountability chart, which is the structure we need and the accountabilities within that division or within that role to actually achieve that. And finally, you've got the level 10 meeting. So that's the first part of that mid-manager meeting is teaching them each of those five tools from a, a higher level perspective, how they fit in, what they're there for, what they do with them. And then the second part is teaching them about LMA. 
And so LMA is another three-letter acronym that EOS loves to use. So EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating System, loves to use three-letter acronyms. LMA is lead and manage to hold people accountable. So we've got five leadership abilities, five kind of management abilities, and, and making sure that we are equally applying those because as a person who manages people, you have to be a leader and a manager. So we teach them what those kind of tools are and what they can use. So it's going a little bit more in depth into how they actually manage their team as well as those five foundational tools. And and how do you recommend that better done? Is that with the implementer or who would you be recommending in the organization share that with them? So I mean, in this particular example, I've done it twice now with my teams and I just think that it, they've really enjoyed it because I'm, I t- I'm a natural teacher. That's what I do. But there's nothing to stop the integrator from doing it. There's nothing to stop. It would be the integrator in the organization is the best person to do it, I think. But yes, having an external person just, it's, I think I had an interview with one of my clients on a podcast just yesterday. And one of the things he said, which really kind of struck home with me is that he can tell his team what he thinks. Mm. I can come in and say exactly the same thing. And they're more likely to listen to me because I'm an external person. And if you think about it, it, it's absolutely true. It's, it just gives a, well, it gives him a reinforcement on, yeah. in terms of what he's saying is, is actually true. But then there's an external person saying it for some reason. Well, I think people a, listen a bit more. Well, validity and credibility. Yeah. So, you, you know, you're, you're in, in this case, you're the expert. Yeah. So it, there's a reinforcement from the, you know, the visionary or the integrator's perspective is to go, you know, it's almost like this is the line of God, you know, this is the reason why it's important, but you know. Over the years as a coach, the amount of times that I've, I've seen that exactly thing happen is, is that, you know, somebody says something, you know, they've been saying it 31 times and all of a sudden the 30 second time somebody else comes in and says exactly the same thing. It's like, oh my God, did you hear what they just said? <laughs> and, you know, that's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, you know, I- interestingly how we, the perception that we have as, of certain individuals from an authoritative perspective, the influence that that then has on how we do things like I, mm. I don't know about you but like if i got pulled over by the police yeah instantaneously like i'm like what's going on what what, what, done, what absolutely and you know there's a there's a there's a you know there's somebody in uniform and your your brain instantly you know clicks in as to you know following the the line and the methodology that you've been you know you've been taught mm-hmm. this is how you're supposed to think yeah yeah that's true so yeah so i think that yeah, it's nice to have somebody to come in externally to actually do that. And also if you're, you know, it's usually done when you're a certain way through the process as well. So you've actually already, you know, you've been doing this for quite some time by the time we actually do that. Bringing somebody fresh in from outside just reinvigorates the team as well. And they're like, oh yeah, okay, this is great. Yeah, it's something new. It's great. Hmm. Yeah. What's your favorite EOS tool? Because we've got the five foundational tools. We've got yeah. 20 tools in the, in the kind of the toolbox. And then we've also got all the additional tools as well, which we tend to pull out on an as-needs basis. Yeah. So one that I really do love is I, I do love Clarity Break. And, you know, th- there's a, it's just so incredibly simple. So I was working with a, a client last week, not on EOS, but, you know, and it's been, it, it's been something that I've been doing for years as a kind of a professional coach. Just that ability to give self-permission to stop blank sheet of paper and just go, okay, what's going on? You know, where, where do I need to allow my mind and my body and my soul to kind of go, you know, what's working, what's not working and just allow things to just kind of like, you know, it's almost like a bit of a snow globe and things just begin to kind of settle. And, you know, it's amazing. Um, I was working with the CEO about a year ago and, um, I was like, look, you know, this is what we're going to do. You know, we're going to just sit down and I'm going to give you the time and space. Oh my God, Adam, come on. I need you to be asking me loads of questions, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, there we go. I'll be back in an hour. And like, and he was, he was sharing with me. He was like, you know, I was trying to fight it. He says, and I got to about 35 minutes and then I just dropped in and he goes, that was the best 25 minutes I've had in the last six months. I'm like, all you, all I, all I did was create the space or gave you the, you know, gave you the permission. And now you just need to do it for you, do it for yourself. We don't do enough of it. I think, you know, we, you know, the, we were talking just before, I think it was before we started recording about the aspect, well, uh, the aspect to now 32. So it used to be, you know, seven, 
now because of all the distractions, it's kind of kind of thirty two. Why why are we keeping ourselves so full? Why are we doing instead of kind of just like you know being? And you know this aspect around kind of you know people talk about meditation. Meditation is very, it, it, for you is going to be potentially different to me. And it doesn't actually make any difference what it is. It's like, what's the thing or the activity or the space that you need that's going to allow you to just be in a different uh, state of mind? That might be walking, might be running. Cycling. Absolutely. It's, it's kind of almost irrelevant, but knowing and understanding for, for self, especially as, uh, as leaders. That's where the gains then begin to come is because you're able to just kind of go, you know, and, and I heard this thing about six months ago called what's the activity from an opposites perspective. I was like, oh, okay, well, what does, what does that mean? And the kind of concept is, is that if you're, if you're out there and you're doing, you know, we, you know, we talk about in, in EOS about, you know, doing what you love with people that you love being compensated accordingly, making time for other pursuits and a huge difference, you know, we get into a state of flow which is great, but what's the thing which is opposite to your natural style, which actually you need to kind of, you know, circuit break your thinking. So the clarity break is, is one from, a, you know, from a time of thinking perspective, but also the, the other thing then is that what's the opposite, which is going to put you in a little in stress and in pressure that's going to actually allow you, allow the, the growth that's going to allow you to kind of, kind of seem. So for me doing improv, yeah. right? I'm actually, I don't like necessarily like labels, but I prefer being on my own in my own, my own space. When I'm on stage performing improv, I've got a paying audience. I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for myself, but I'm right on the edge of my comfort zone. Cause it's like, I'm uncomfortable. Where's the learning and the growth that's coming from this mm -hmm. that feeds me to then take everything back into the kind of the day to day. So what's your opposite? What, what do you do? Cause you like, you love being with people. You love being in front of people. What's the thing that allows you to kind of just do and think differently? Yeah. So for me, it is definitely cycling is one of the things, because even though you have to have a little bit of concentration about you don't crash into cars and stuff like that, but generally cycling throughout nature, I'm, I'm not able to be distracted by anybody or anything, which means I have to actually sit with my own thoughts, which is something you don't do when you're always surrounded by other people, always looking at what they need and what you, how you can help them. And then also, so Steve and I often go away to places where we deliberately pick a place where it's away from people, away from Wi-Fi, away from technology, mm -hmm. just to sort of spend time in nature because I enjoy being in nature. Photography is another thing that I do that actually really takes my mind away from everything else that I do. So yes, yeah, so that's what I, I try to do. Just, just on that then. So when you're, when you go to those places where there's no Wi-Fi and you're out in nature, how yeah. long does it take you to kind of just drop into being into a different state? Oh, it takes a while. I'm yeah. being really honest. It's not sort of like a quick switch off thing. And there's, you know, a lot of these things have become habits for us, right? So yep. checking your phone regularly, I don't know, just worrying about what's going on. So I, I, we also play games. So we actually play games to get out of the, the, the normal routine, if you like, because mm. then that's putting my mind in, I still have to use my mind to play the game and I'm yep. very competitive. So I want to win, but it's a different type of thinking as opposed to thinking about business and yep. about what I normally do. Favorite game? Favorite game. So we actually got introduced to a new one while we were away oh. last time. I'm trying to think what it's. It's called, oh, it's something to do, it's a Portuguese game about tiles, come what it's called, but it's, it was amazing. It's a real strategic game that looks really simple until you actually start playing it and then you realize there's a whole lot more thinking that goes underneath it. I think it's called Azure or something like that, which is quite good. And then we like jigsaw puzzles. Yeah. So I, I used to... I used to fight doing jigsaw puzzles because my mum used to do them. I thought it was really geeky. Yeah. And I always thought jigsaw puzzles were people who are just uh, are really dull and uh, can't do anything else. And then I started to realize that lots of people that I know do jigsaw puzzles. And so it suddenly became acceptable in my mind to do that. Mm -hmm. And now I really enjoy jigsaw puzzles. How many, what, what, you know, what's the maximum number of people? Kind of got oh, we do, we do the thousand, a thousand pieces just because we've actually got, we live in a very tiny home. So we have a. A, a jigsaw board that we can fold up and put away when we're not using it yeah. and it will hold a thousand pieces jigsaw yeah. puzzle that's it so we just got a recent one we just ordered about to arrive hopefully soon a friend of ours is very much into astrophotography he managed to grab uh, a beautiful shot out at her newer falls and we had the the lights that what, what was it called that oh, we had just recently the aurora. the aurora yeah so he's got the aurora over her newer falls with all the stars in the wow. background beautiful picture yeah so it's gonna be a pain in the ass to do you can imagine 
lots of red and orange and lots of stars, but not quite. You know, so did you did you see the aurora? I didn't. I missed it. Right. I know. I'm because so I went bummed. out. I went outside. Yeah. Right, and I'm looking out, and it's like it just seemed a different shade of black. Very very subtly for me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Naomi, the kids are going, "Oh my god, can you see it?" I'm like, uh, "What am I looking at?" Yeah. Oh. I know I, we didn't see it at all because we actually live right in the heart of the city. Yeah. So there was no chance of actually seeing it without going out somewhere. Yeah. And to be honest, I wasn't really aware of it until after I saw the things on Facebook, people kind of going, look at the aurora. I was like, oh, okay. I love seeing those beams of people just kind of going, oh, here's me with the aurora. And just Scribbled. Like... <laughs> Good. So, so we go back to clarity breaks. One of yeah. the things that I always use to describe it, and I think this is really important because um, I, I had a client who fought clarity breaks for two years, would not do it, mm -hmm. didn't need to, no way am I going to do that, don't see any value. And the way I kind of describe it is, you know, if you've got a glass that has got some sand in the bottom of it, if you're always moving, which we often are, and fighting fires and doing all the stuff that goes on, if you're always moving, that, that sand is always up in the water and the water becomes very cloudy. As soon as you put the glass down, allow it to settle, the, the sand settles to the bottom and then suddenly you have that clarity of the water. You can see what's really going on. So after two years of fighting it, she finally went ahead and she took herself to a beach, took herself with a pad, yeah. no technology, sat on the beach. The beach is just around the corner from her home. And since then, she has become an absolute advocate of it. She said, I didn't, couldn't believe that something as simple as sitting still with nothing going on and just taking a pad and pen could have such a major impact. She came back from that session. She had rethought what people moves she had to make in the business, where they were headed, why they had got the direction wrong in terms of the future growth, and just got all this stuff out of her head onto a piece of paper. Now she does them every single month. I Often when I'm speaking to people, I, I, I find that uh, a lot of the feedback is around getting in touch with their intuition. So, you know, it depends, you know, but for most people, I, I found that their intuition is really, really strong, mm -hmm. but they get busied yep. with other stuff. And mm -hmm. the clarity break allows them to just kind of, it's almost like the Axis Monday just becomes a lot more centered. And then it's like, oh, I know you always knew what you needed to do. It's just now that you've got that time and that space, like you say, kind of for this kind of sand to just kind of settle and go, I know exactly what I need to do. I actually remember we did the mastermind program last year for smaller businesses who were looking to do EOS. I had been talking about that and talking about that and talking about that for a long, 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 long time. And then one day I decided, right, we're going to go take a clarity boat. We went away to one of these places we go to. There's no Wi-Fi. I sat there for a couple of hours and I was actually... I was reading a book, which is by one of our fellow EOS implementers. And then I'd go away and I'd sit with a piece of paper for an hour. Then I'd read a bit more of the book. I'd go away, sit away for another hour. And literally in a couple of hours, I had completely planned out the entire mastermind program. I knew exactly what the six modules were, what we were going to cover, everything ready to go, came back, briefed the VA to get the website up and running, and we launched it a week later. Now, that is, that's the power of a clarity break. It's not I didn't know what I mm. wanted to do, but I just never, ever had the chance to sit down and get it out of my head. So what's your favorite tool? My favorite tool? So I, I've got a new one at the moment. So I always say level 10 meetings. I love level 10 meetings. I think they really are a game changer. Yeah. But a getting what you want tool. Since we, because don't forget as EOS implementers, we also have our quarterlies. Yeah. We also have our ongoing development. Every quarterly that we do with EOS, we always deep dive into a tool. And we deep dive into the getting what you want tool. And I had seen it many, many times in our toolbox and kind of knew what it was there for, but didn't really fully appreciate the power of that simple tool. I mean, it's a really stupid, simple tool that sort of says, hey, start with, you know, what the end in mind, what is it you actually really, really want, and then just work backwards and put the steps in beforehand to work out what needs to be done to get to that end point. And when you start using that, you start to get your scorecard and your measurables out of it. You start to get your process out of it. Like this one tool basically does everything almost that you need to do with an EOS. Yep. It can help you set your rocks, your scorecard, your, yeah, looking at your process. Everything can be done from that very, very simple tool. So I'm finding I'm using it a lot more with clients now, particularly when they say, oh, we don't know what to measure or, oh, we can't, oh, process. I mean, I know we've got the three-step process document and that is in itself is a powerful tool, um, but put in, combining it with getting what you want, it just gets people thinking about everything is actually a process, right? Yeah, it kind of reminds me of, our thoughts are only our thoughts unless they're verbalized or written down. Mm -hmm. So it kind of goes back to that aspect, you know, we spoke about before in the fact that if it's here in front of you now, you know how to deal with it. Yep. And something in the, in the future is a bit of a blur and it kind of, it bridges the gap between those yeah. and, you know, start with the end of mind, Stephen Covey and go mm -hmm. back, go back, go back. And then like you say, it's almost like those light bulb moments, which is like, 
Ah. Oh. Especially getting your leading indicators. Because I think people kind of go, oh, it's easy to get to the lagging indicators. We don't know what the leading indicators are. Just work through what the end thing is, which is your lagging indicator. Mm. Now think about all the things that come before that. They're your leading indicators. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But it is. And so, but I think that the great thing is I, I tend to have a different favorite tool at different times, depending mm -hmm. on where I am in the journey with a client or I've got a lot of clients at the moment who are just starting. So we're in that focus day vision building and the getting what you want tool is really, really helpful yeah. for the clients who are later on in the journey. I really love the merger and acquisition tool. I wish that everybody would actually use that tool before they even think about merging or acquiring another business because it's stuff in there that is not the legal side. It's not the financial viability side. It's about actually, is this a fit? Yeah. 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 And I, the, one of the things that I also really, really love is, and it goes back to that kind of 32 touch points, but you, you, you re revisit a tool in later on in the journey and you're like, oh, Adam, come on, we've done this one before. It's like, look, just bear with me. Yep. Look at it through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Let's just like re revisit it. And some of those sessions are just like hugely, oh, sorry, Adam, you were right. Well, it's like reading a book, right? I mean, like, yeah. we, we've all got favorite books we've read more than once. And the first time you're like, oh my God, this book is amazing. And then the second time you read it and you kind of go, oh, I missed that first time around. There's something else in there. And the mm -hmm. third time, because some of our books I've read five, six times, yep. Prosperous Coach, one of my favorites. It just, you know, every time you read it, you're coming from a different place because of the experience that you now have, the stuff that you've done in the time being. And so then you're seeing different things in it. And the tools are the same. You know, you get so used to using them, but, or you... You've done them once and think, well, that's it. I've done it. But well, you come back for a second time and, and you get more out of it. And it's it. like listening to this podcast. Like you kind of don't know necessarily what's coming. Yep. You've got, we, we don't either. Like, we could just fly by the seat of our pants. Yeah. But actually, sometimes you you hear something you've heard before and all of a sudden, you know, you need to you need to hear it at that moment in time. So you've heard it 31 times before. But at this moment, because the way that the kind of everything else is going, it's, it's kind of almost like, you know, the dials all kind of, you know, flipping in together and all of a sudden the code is just there yeah. and somebody says something and you go, I already know that, but now's exactly the right point that I need to hear it because now I c I'm in the right space that I can execute it. That's, you know, and I think that's the kind of the, the, you know, the teacher and the educator in me is that those moments are like just, ju they're just golden. Yeah. Um, and often I think we make the assumption that people are on the same path and the same journey at, as us mm -hmm. so you you know you're you're sat with a with a group of people and it's like well, why could, why are these why why are people just not getting it and understand it like yeah because they're in a different space yeah i kind of like um you know and this again this is similar to kind of you know what's the right time to kind of roll it out to you know leadership teams except not leadership teams the next, the next, level, level, down. Down, the next yep. level down is i kind of use the analogy of that you know when there's a divorce one party has, dis has been spending a lot of time thinking about it and they've gone through, you know, they've gone through the pain and the grief cycle and they get to the point that they say, hey, Deborah, I just it's need done. to let you know it's done, yeah. right? So at that point, I've already, you know, I'm now in kind of, you know, recovery mode and I'm going to come up and you've literally, I've just dropped the bombshell on you. You know, you're a completely different part. And this is the reason why, you know, there's so many, there's so much tension and disagreement, but. Yeah, but you just don't understand. You know, we're finished. What do you mean we're finished? Like, <laughs> and, and I think we, we often need to be really mindful and aware of where other people are, people are at. Don't think about it from our own perspective. Where, think about it from the person or the people that we're with and going, right, if I put myself in their shoes, like this, there's an aspect around radical empathy where you, you don't just think, but you almost kind of embody and go, right, okay, so if I was Deborah in this moment in time, with the situation and the circumstances and the, and the lack of knowledge and the lack of awareness, what's going to be going on for her at that moment in time? Right. Literally transpose my book, you know, my mind into her. Okay. Now I can begin to start understanding that she doesn't have, she, she doesn't have the knowledge and the understanding mm -hmm. that I've got. She hasn't got the experience and you know, the, the aspects of working with an implementer. Right. So what do I need to do to be able to support and guide through that? Yeah. It was brought home to me yesterday when I was working with a team where at the end of the session, and it was, a, you know, it was a good seven hour session. And at the end of the session, they said they were all very exhausted and overwhelmed. And I thought, well, it's quite an easy session for me. But then I, I'd forget that, you know, I do it day in, day out. Yep. And so the, the, the difficult questions that I ask just come naturally. And of course, I, they're on the other receiving end of that. So they're actually having to really potentially do things they've never done before. Yeah. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but also 
the you're there from a process perspective the emotiveness of the conversations you're not necessarily involved because you're not involved in the on That's the day-to-day right. so the 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 burden that you're carrying is very very different to to what they're going through yeah yeah so anyway hey we're probably out of time for this particular podcast but I have enjoyed it so much. I think we should do these more regularly. I think we should. I think we should do these at least once a month. So I'm, I'm just on the fly saying we're now going to start doing these once a month. So once a month, you're going to get the benefit of listening to Adam and I just talk shit, make it up, wing it, and do and share the stuff that we're doing. But isn't that what life's all about? That is exactly what life is all about. Yeah. So I hope that you've all enjoyed this. It's been really great having Adam on the show. Thank you so much. And we will see you again in a month. Bye for now. Thank you.